Welcome to the Lynn Community Television Show. I'm Sean Donahue. Here with me today, Rich Biagiotti. Rich, thanks for being here today. Um, we've had Rich here two times before, and we're talking about college financial solutions. Our first two steps were getting your FSA ID number, um, and then talking about the options that would become in existence right afterwards, uh, actually filling out your FAFSA form. And now we're on step two, which is fulfillment, then repeat. Um, so, Rich, we're here today to talk about the, uh, the process that the FAFSA goes through once they've gotten your application. Um, what comes next? Awesome question. What comes next right now is very, very importantly for both the parents and the students are to relax. You've got all of the hard work behind you. Now what you're going to do is you are now going to be sitting here looking at the results of what you have just done by doing the FSA ID and filling out the FAFSA form. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to talk about a complete course and a wrap up of what this whole financial aid package did. And first of all is this the college cost environment. What you did right now is you just threw yourself into the college to find out what money do they have, what money do you need, and how do we make it work. So we're going to talk about the nuts and bolts of the financial aid package which you're actually going to receive. We're going to talk about the elements, the specific elements of that package. How is it comprised? What are you going to have to pay? And how does it work? We're also going to talk about how to get the most for your college money out of this whole process. So there are three certainties that we're all sure about. Is that first of all, college costs, as you can see, are increasing at a much greater rate than inflation. They've been going up at about 6% a year. And it's also true that grant and scholarship aid is not going to keep pace. Now, I'll ask you out there in the public, how many of you are alumni of college? And how many of you have been solicited recently by your college asking you for money and contributions? That is the money that is part of the basis of what your son or daughter are going to receive in the form of a scholarship. That's how that happens. Now, when we're talking about some of the nuts and bolts of financial aid, this is what you're going to see in the award letter. First of all, there are grants and scholarships. This is the premier, the best kind of financial aid because that is literally free money to the students. They get it, they keep it, they use it for college. That is fantastic. Now that's absolutely fantastic. Now the next part of it is loans. Now you'd say, why in goodness name is a loan considered financial aid? Well, first of all, because it's probably going to be deferred, which means that it's not going to be required to be paid until the student graduates from college. That's number one. Number two, there's also a strong possibility that some of that interest on that loan will be deductible either to you or the student in the future. That's very, very good. The third part of financial aid that will be awarded to you and you'll see on your financial aid award letter will be work study. That's actually a job that your student will be awarded. Now, don't think that that's free money. Know that money from work study is not going to go directly to the financial aid office. That money is going to go to your student. So unless you have an extraordinarily special student that's going to mail that check home to mom and dad, don't expect that to be helping you pay the college bills, it's merely going to help them to exist on campus. I mean, to be quite honest, I mean, if you've got that special student that's willing to do that, please tell me the secret and I'll, I'll, I will actually profess that to all of my other parents on how to do that. Okay. But the next part of that is, this is in general, your student will be declared to be a dependent student. As a dependent student, when you filled out the FAFSA form, that means that as a dependent student, they are going to look at the information that's been processed on that form pertaining to the student and to the parent means what did the student make, what did the parent make. So that's very, very important. Now, <clears throat> the definition of financial need. This is how this whole thing works. In the global umbrella of everything, that's called the cost of attending the school. Now, by you filling out the FAFSA form, they actually generated a number we mentioned briefly called the expected family contribution. If the cost of attending the college is greater than expected family contribution, that's called need. That means that there's money missing. Now what the financial aid officer, and we'll do right now as they're preparing the financial aid award letter for you to receive in hand, will be to prepare a financial aid letter and an award letter indicating how they are going to meet that need and to what aspect and amount of that need they're going to meet. Now if you want to check that out ahead of time, you can either go to Barnes and Noble and go in there under the college thing and there's a book about that thick that says College Board dot com scholarships and colleges if you look at that most of the schools will tell you how much need they will meet so in other words if the cost of the school is fifty grand and your expected family contribution is ten and you have forty thousand dollars worth of need as a for instance where harvard will meet a hundred percent of your need they will give you a forty thousand dollar package some of the schools might say we'll give you sixty percent so they might give you twenty four thousand dollars in that scenario this is what you need to be aware of when you're reviewing this award letter 
And this is going to be part of the reason why the award letter is so important to you. But let's go back to the EFC for just a second. Okay. Your expected family contribution is comprised of two things, the parental contribution and the student contribution. The way they look at this generally is the parental contribution is, part, is two parts. It's based on the parental income and the parental assets. They calculate that. Then they take the student income and the student assets. They add that both up, and that's what your expected family contribution is. That's the result of the FAFSA form. So this is where negotiating point for you with the college is very important because what would happen if all of a sudden there were layoffs in your company and you just got a pink slip and you know that as of June of this year you're going to be unemployed? Well, that affects your parental contribution, but it's nowhere reflected on the FAFSA form. This gives you a talking point and a reason to have a review with the financial aid office to explain what is going to happen, not what has happened. The FAFSA report and the result of that is based on what had happened. They're making the assumption that that's going to continue to happen. Right. If there is a change, this is a very important situation for you to discuss. So we're suggesting that these parents, once they receive their award letter uh, th through the FAFSA process, um, for, they're, they're going to receive an award letter for each school that they got into. Correct. correct? Um, you're suggesting that they network with the financial mm -hmm. officer, financial aid officer at that school correct. to really talk about what their additional options are. Correct. So outside, you know, things change. Um, when you had filled out this FAFSA application, if you became recently unemployed, maybe there's a divorce or there's some type of stipulation that comes in to change your economic standing, then you need to actually go make the financial aid officer aware at these local schools. Now, outside of FAFSA, once they receive this FAFSA award, can their financial aid officers give them any additional resources for funding? That is an awesome question, and yes, they can. The financial aid officers were basically empowered by the government, I want to say six or seven years ago, when now they are actually able to grant any federal money directly to the students on behalf of the government for them to go and get these loans, etc. <coughs> However, the financial aid officer is also in charge of the endowment of the school in actuality they can decide how much of the school's money they need to give to the student and or family based on the circumstances. And remember, the FAFSA form is only giving them the baseline of some of the circumstances because there are many questions that are not asked for on the FAFSA form. For instance, one that has been recently asked for, it says, is either of the parent a dislocated worker? Now that's what we just talked about. If you think that something is going to be changing in the future, this is when you need to have a dialogue with the financial aid officer at the school. The other thing is, a lot of parents will ask, wow, Rich, we've gotten into all of our students' financial, all of the schools he applied to or she applied to. This is wonderful. We don't know what to do now. We're looking at four different financial aid award letters, and we're confused. They all seem to be giving us a different amount of money, and when I'm asking you to review the financial aid award letter, it's two parts. Not only is it how much of an award are they giving you for the freshman year? Part number two, is that going to be repeated the sophomore year and the junior year and the senior year? Or is it a one year only? The other thing is when you're looking at that award letter and you come down and you say, this is really great, Rich, because it looks like with these two schools, we're only going to have to spend $10,000 to go to the school. I would say, could you please look back at that award and find out if that's $10,000 and no loans were given to the student, so it's all scholarships, because if that's the case, then at the end of the freshman year, the student will only owe $10,000. Well, if the other school says that you're only going to have to pay $10,000, but it turns out that they gave you $15,000 worth of loans, now it might be that the reality of that is it really cost you $25,000 to look at that school. So please look beyond what it looks like the bottom line is for this year. And this is where you might be able to negotiate one school versus another school. So some of these FAFSA forms, like you, what we're saying is when we, when we receive our award, um, the awards could be anything from a loan to a grant to a scholarship. Correct. Ideally, we want scholarships. Correct. We don't want loans, but sometimes they <coughs> are loans. Correct. And the other thing is when you're talking about negotiating with a school about these grants and scholarships and loans, in many cases, depending on the school, if you receive an outside scholarship, let's say $10,000, some of the schools will say, oh, fine, you keep the scholarship. Some of the other schools will say, well, that's great, but because you received that scholarship, we're going to take $10,000 of money away that we gave you because you already oh, got that. Okay. 
Now this may be the case in point when you want to negotiate with that person to say, if you're going to take $10,000 worth of financial aid away from my student, could you take maybe that in loans and work study that my son or daughter got? So reduce my income that you're going to give me by a loan and a, and a, a work study because you can reaward that to some other needy student, but don't take away something that's free money for my student. It sounds like there's a, a, a bit of negotiating that Absolutely. needs to be had, some tactics, so to say, in order to get the best result. And, and, and it really comes down to the parents. I mean, this is a, it's a big burden on them. You really have to pay attention to, to what you're doing throughout this whole entire process. And as you're doing this also, please, when you ask for a review of the package, if you think it's warranted, and you're going to go in there, please don't stand up on the desk and jump up and down and say, you didn't give my son enough money or you didn't right. give my daughter enough. That doesn't work well. No. Establish a good eye-to-eye, -eye, face to face, no like and trust relationship with that financial aid advisor. Right. And then if you think that one school gave your son or daughter a little more money than the school that they really want to go to, find out before you ask the question, do those schools compete? In other words, is that school really going to care about losing a student to, the to this school guy. here. If they are, they might be likely to pony up. And the other thing I'll say is that when you go and ask for a review of the package, I know this is going to sound quite salesy, and I guess it is, but I would like you to call up, first of all, send a letter requesting a review to the financial aid officer. Not just to the financial aid officer of the, school, of the say, the office, but find out who the financial aid officer is going to be for your student for the next four years. Send them a letter, call them up about a week later and say, hello, did you receive my letter? If you didn't, I can fax or email that to you one right now. And by the way, I'm gonna be in your neck of the woods next week at 10.30 in the morning, could I set up an appointment? When they say yes, please show up with a cup of coffee and ask them, what do you want with your coffee? Is that a, a brand or a Danish? Yep. When you go in there, make nice create a relationship and the first thing your student should do when they arrive on campus and they unpack their dorm room the first appointment that they should have is to just walk by the financial aid office go in there introduce themselves and shake the hand of the financial aid officer and actually say to them if it wasn't for you I wouldn't be here yeah let and them then, know absolutely and then by the way this is going to sound tacky but it works just before Thanksgiving, please go back to that person, give them a handwritten and signed Thanksgiving card. Just before Christmas, do the same thing and ask them, when you give them the handwritten card for Christmas, say, by the way, I'm not sure if this is possible, but from what I've heard, in many cases, students do not come back after their freshman first semester. So would you mind if I stopped back and checked in the office? Because I know some of those people who might not come back may have given up the second scholarship or the second financial aid piece that they got and I would love to come back and sit there and if you could tell me if there was a way to apply to get that I could ease the burden on my parents on me and then create and continue this relationship maybe you send them an Easter card maybe you send them a graduation card do this for the four years I know when, when I was at Northeastern I got a great scholarship getting in there and I got more financial aid when I was at Northeastern in the form of individual scholarships that I applied for when I was there than I did getting in. Right. This is a business partnership. Big time. I, I think, you know, one of the biggest points that the parents can take is that this, these schools are businesses and they function very much like any other business. And you, as a prospective salesperson, <coughs> are working to develop a partnership with them. So making nice, developing a working relationship um, that, that benefits both parties isn't only important, it's imperative. It really is imperative to your success. Um, so we've covered a lot in this three-part series. Uh, we've talked about the fulfillment process. We've talked about what happens when you've got your um, uh, FAFSA forms complete and you receive your awards. You can go out to your financial aid officers, talk to them about your additional resources, know exactly what you're getting for FAFSA. Is it a loan? Is it a grant? Is it, um, is it a scholarship? Ideally, we want scholarships. If it's scholarships, does it make sense to apply for scholarships in the future? Maybe you want to apply for grants. Maybe you want to apply for non-interest loans. Um, what's really interesting about this whole process, Rich, is that it's going to continue. Freshman year is not the end. Can prepare for it for sophomore year. Are there any tricks and tips that you can give these parents for preparing? Awesome. Yes, and thank you. Remember now, the first year is the worst year. 
That is the year that, first of all, the federal government will give the student the smallest loans. And then, Sean, if you and I are alumni of this college right here, and you look, I don't know if you got this scenario your freshman year at college, but I did, and this, the professor said, look to your right, look to your left, those people aren't going to be here next year. So why would we alumni, giving a large donation to the endowment field, want to give any money to freshmen right. with the hope that there's one out of three? So for your upperclassmen, there is more money available for the upperclassmen. However, if you, this is when the student comes into play. A participating student, as far as the college is concerned, will be a participating alumni. You nailed it. This is a business. Participating alumni are more likely to recontribute to that experience that they remember that they had at college. So now let me just summarize the financial aid application. You need to know what forms to use. Every school requires the FAFSA form. Some schools require the profile form. So you need to know that. You need to apply every year, and you need to apply no matter what, even if you don't think you're going to get financial aid for those reasons we mentioned. You want to apply as early as possible and as accurate as possible, because the early bird gets the worm as they're giving money out. So these are very, very important aspects. Also, be ready to explain your answers. On the FAFSA form, I explained that there was a section on there which said the IRS retrieval tool. Some of the schools will actually verify, they want to verify that the numbers you put down in the FAFSA form are accurate, and you can actually go to the IRS website. We just recently have had an awful lot of information requested by colleges for our parents. So we're getting parents calling in saying, Rich, did, should I give this information to them? In many cases, the schools are now requesting W-2 forms for the, for the parents. And you say, well, why would a W-2 form be important? Because I already gave them the information from the IRS retrieval tool. Take a look at your W-2 form. One of the very important aspects of what's on your W-2 form that's not on your tax return, how much did you put into your 401k? That shows up in box 12. Well, if that shows up in box 12, it doesn't show up on the, on the IRS form, but if it shows up in box 12, the schools know that you earned that money and you could have elected to contribute that for college costs. So they want to verify that. That's one of the reasons why they're asking for this. And also, do yourself a favor, make a copy of your tax return anyway, because some of the schools want to do this. They want to know about this. And then the need analysis. You want to lower your expected family contribution. How are you doing that? By telling the truth. Are you taking care of a parent or a grandparent? Are you taking care of someone? Do you, one of the reasons is lower your expected family contribution. If you've got a big asset and a pile of money over here and you're trying to preserve that $50,000, but if you've got a $30,000 car loan over here that's costing you a lot of money, it may behoove you to pay off that loan, increase your cash flow on a monthly basis, reduce the asset that doesn't count against you because the school is looking at the asset, not the liability. So these are some of the strategies. And that's one of the reasons by increasing the college costs. Most of us do not, re do not record our medical expenses anymore because they're not deductible. However, if you've got some students that they require a puffer, or they require other medication, or you require other medication, there is no place to talk about that. This is part of that dialogue you're going to have with the financial aid people. When you're asking for the review of the package, that's when this is going to come up. You also want to continue to save for retirement because you are, by you saving for retirement, if you put in $4,000 into your retirement, you save $1,000 in taxes. You could use that tax to pay, tax refund to pay a loan in the student's name. And you cannot borrow for your retirement, but you can for college in the student's name. Also, make sure that when you're looking at these colleges, have the students become grounded. Make sure that they're looking at financial aid offices, officerings at the college. Make sure that it looks like they're in the top 25% of the incoming class for the freshman profile. They're going to be more likely to get much better awards in grants and scholarships than it is in loans. You know, try for an academic scholarship. Just apply. Go to guidance. Talk to them if there's anything out there. Look for athletic scholarships. Even if you're not an all-star, consider staying in the state of Massachusetts. And as you mentioned earlier, even with the state school program, consider cooperative education. It's a great way to test the waters to see if that job that you think you want, if you're going to like it or not. Right. If Just it makes to sense it to take the major. Yes. <laughs> you know, or, gee, mom, dad, I didn't realize that that four years I spent in college that this is what the job is going to be. Oh, right. my goodness, I don't like this. Right. <laughs> Find out now. There's, there, there's, there's tons of, of tactic that goes into absolute And strategy and planning. Um, it's, it's, it's really, it, it seems as though it's a lot up, up front. You're, you're looking at the tip of the iceberg, absolutely. Um, but once you kind of get going, it's like anything else. Take that first step and Good you'll time. find yourself going downhill. Um, <coughs> a lot of these parents out there are looking at it as though, all right, how am I going to receive this check? And a lot of it has to do with, hey, work with the government, 
work in, t- in ties with them and make sure that they know what you can do and they're going to let you know what they can do. And that's a, you just said the government, great segue. If you remember when I said you're filling out the FAFSA form and you need to write everything down, this is going to be the replay because what you want to do is if you write everything down, that's so important because your accountant, when you go to get your taxes done this year, they don't know that your student is away at college. Right. Well, if your student is away at college, you will qualify for basically an IRS tax scholarship called the American Opportunity Credit. That could potentially be up to $2,500 back in taxes. Now, you can use that to float a loan in your student's name. You would also be able to possibly have some student loan interest deduction that you might even be able to take as a deduction. This is why this is very, very important. And once you set this process in play, every year, pull the binder off the shelf, open it up. You just have to repeat the steps. It's going to be so simple because you created the process, you're living with the process, you're working with the process, and it's not extra work. It's just the job you need to do for college, for the four, five, or six years, or even for grad school for your student. When the student graduates, if you've created that binder with all of the loans and scholarships and everything else, when the student graduates, give them the book because that is their four years worth of financial experience at the college. Right in one nutshell. And they've built up a ton of credit too in the Perfect. meantime. Um, Rich, can't thank you enough for coming on to the program. Um, we've been talking about college financial solutions. This is the third part of a three-part series. Um, if you're interested in watching those first two series, I'm sure they'll be accessible to you um, right on uh, our YouTube page and on our channel as well. So uh, Rich, can't thank you enough for coming on. Uh, those parents who are going out there and they're, they're trekking into the financial uh, aid process, Um, Stay strong, stay organized, stay tactical, um, and stay calm. Uh, Rich, again, thanks so much for coming on to the program. That's it for the Lynn Community Television Show from the studio here at Lynn Community TV. I'm Sean Donahue, wishing you all the best.